We are now coming into our second letter, and that is the letter to the church at Smyrna. So I want us to go to Revelation. If it is in your notes, that's fine. I'm reading from the ESV and English uh, Standard Version. The angel of the church in Smyrna, verses 8 through verse 11, right? Writes, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Let's just pause there for a while. There are certain people of a certain faith that said Jesus never ever said that he was God. This verse, I am the first and the last, died and came back to life. You know that this is Jesus who is speaking, correct? Now, if you look at Isaiah 44 and verse 6, and this is what it says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, if you want to take down the reference, Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, the Redeemer and Lord of hosts, Almighty God, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. So, is Jesus claiming to be the Lord God? Yes, he is. Because there are some who say Jesus never ever said that he was God. Only the people say that he is God. He did say, I am the first and the last. Isaiah, God says, I am the first and the last. Now, that is why, you know, now you notice Isaiah 44, verse 6, I, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel. You notice that when Jesus died on the cross, Pilate put above his cross the King of the Jews or the King of Israel. And they said, no, 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 take it down. You cannot put that on up there, up there. It was not because, you know, Jesus said he was king. They didn't want that. They didn't want him to be king. They were, when Pilate put that up there, it was actually a fulfillment of the prophetic, uh, of this prophecy, Isaiah 44, verse 6, where Jesus is now proclaimed publicly, <laughs> although he's on the cross, as God. And they say, no, no, you cannot do that. He is not the king of Israel because there's only one king of Israel. That's God. So you understand why the anger when Pilate said, put that up there above his cross. And he says, what I've done, I've spoken, it is spoken. He will be called the king of the Jews or the king of Israel, so to speak. Okay, so that, that's just a little throw in. So you understand now from this scripture where Jesus claims to be God. Okay, let's go on. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. That's why I call this poor but rich. I know your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews, but they are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. In other words, you will be suffering. Behold, the devil is about to throw you, about to, about to. It's going to happen. Some of you to prison that you may be tested and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, the one who conquers, the one who overcomes. So you notice that to all the churches, it is always the one who overcomes. Continue to be an overcomer. Okay, be an overcomer, a conqueror. Those who conquer will not be hurt by the second death. So let's go into the study now. We talked about the city of Ephesus, uh, that it was a very vile city because it was a port and uh, of course you know everybody came into the city of Ephesus for trade commerce it was a trade of commercially but he also harbored a lot of criminals there was no military presence uh, Roman military presence in that city so everything was a free for all kind of thing uh, the temple was categorized by uh, temple prostitutes sex, the princess, uh, I mean, the goddess Diana, sorry, forgive me, forgive me, the goddess Diana, Artemis, was there. It was a prosperous city. It was 35 miles north of Ephesus, further up north of Ephesus. Prosperous city, it had a population of about 100,000 in John's day, and uh, this location has been inhabited for, according to history, for more than 3,000 years, but then it was destroyed 
uh, by a massive earthquake a few years before the birth of Jesus. But then it was completely rebuilt and it began to thrive. It possessed a very safe harbor, just like Ephesus, where ships from all over the world came to buy, to sell goods. It was called the Crown City because, you know, there were hills surrounded by hills and it resembled a crown. So it was called a crown city. It was also called the Flower of Asia because it was like blossoming like a flower. When the city chose a motto to be imprinted on their coins, they chose the phrase first in Asia in size and beauty. This was on the coins that they found as the archaeologists began to dig. Now, this is the thing that I've been trying to say. The Bible is a historical, factual book. It is not mythology. I mean, no, no myths in it. <laughs> oh man, I don't know why I'm running out of words. It's, it's not myths. A lot of different faiths or religions have a lot of mythology. That's the word. Mythology involved in it. You know, many-headed, uh, you know, flying donkeys or whatever, what, unicorns, name it, you know. And, and a lot of it is just mythology. Whereas the Bible, you can check facts and figures right from the beginning itself. In Genesis, you have Abraham leaving. Now, when, when, the, when early days, when they talked about Abraham leaving the Earl of the Chaldees, people began to laugh. There's no such city. They began to prove that this, this was not true. Archaeologists found the entire city of the Earl of the Chaldees. Babylonian city, and and they unearthed it. It was a thriving city when Abraham left it. So the idea, you know, that Bible is mythological, there's no such thing. Everything is facts and figures. They talk about the names of the kings, which you can trace in history. When you go through the Bible, you find, you know, different kings reign what year to what year, which king followed. Everything is historical factual you can trace it and so now in the book of revelation you have an actual church this is i mean in in the city of smyrna there it was an actual city there are actual coins that have been found by archaeology now archaeology doesn't prove that the bible is right it just confirms that the bible is right that's about it it doesn't prove the bible is right the bible is always right amen so several characteristics that uh, made the city very special. First of all, uh, it was famous for the production of myrrh. Myrrh is a substance actually from a shrub-like tree. And uh, it produced a kind of bitter gum. What happens was they take the leaves of this tree and they crush it. And the moment they crush it, a very fragrant odor comes out from, from this little shrub, all right? It's not a big tree kind of thing. It's, you know... Quite a, quite a good size, but not a huge tree. So they crush the leaves and out of it comes myrrh. Myrrh was used as a fragrance by those living. They would put it as a fragrance, but also mainly to uh, for the dead, right? Embalm the, embalming agent for the dead. And of course, it was mentioned in the life and ministry of Jesus when he was born. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. One, to talk about his kingship, gold, frankincense, to talk about his priest, and of course, myrrh, to talk about his sacrificial death as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So the word myrrh means bitter. It means bitter. And it came to be associated with suffering, okay, pain and death. Now, so that was one of the first characteristics about it. It, had the, it was famous for its production of myrrh. It was also a very planned city, unlike most of the city in those days uh, that were just, you know, erected and roads going through it. Whereas Smyrna was a very planned city. And we like, we like planned cities, don't we? You know, the roads are wide, proper drainage. You know, it, the city, these cities don't flood because there's very proper drainage. Other cities flood very often because no proper drainage was done. Then, you know, electrical wiring right underground. We, we like planned cities. So Smyrna was a planned city. It was also a very religious uh, city. It had many temples dedicated to the pantheon of gods and goddesses that they worship, Zia, Sibel, Apollos, Aphrodite, again. In fact, there was a street that was paved with gold that ran from the temple of Zeus all the way to the temple of Sibel. 
And uh, pagan religions basically dominated the entire life and the landscape of Smyrna. But there was also inside of it a thriving Jewish community because it was a thriving city and the Jews were very good at making business. So they moved into these cities. And it was in those cities, you know, now remember when the gospel was first preached, it was preached to the Jews first and then later on to non-Jews. So it reached the Jews first. The apostles' mission was first get the Jews, let them know that the Messiah had come. Then from there, let them spread uh, who this Messiah was. They were more ably informed to spread the gospel with the entire Bible that they had. Okay? That's why the Jews were reached first. So it was a religion, uh, you know, also a city that was, like I said, it was a planned city. It was a very religious city. It was also a free city. They were intensely loyal to Rome. And, uh, you know, so what happened was, but again, Rome did have a garrison in Smyrna. They were a free city, but Rome this time did have a garrison there. It was beautiful. It was wealthy, but it was a pagan city. And right in the midst of it, there existed a community of strong believers. That's the wonderful thing about it. Uh, God has his light in a place of darkness, salt, in order to savor or to keep the place from being destroyed. Smyrna was undergoing intense persecution, you know, because of the pantheon of gods and goddesses and multifaceted, all kinds of religions because each one worshipped different gods. And so Christianity came in as an affront against them because Christianity preached one God. There is but one God and they hated this idea. And uh, so they were under tremendous persecution. Tremendous persecution. So the Lord comes to them with a word of comfort in these dark days. And he tells them that even though they appear to be so weak, so poor, yet he comes to them with a word of comfort. Remember, there's a commendation, complaint, correction, comfort. So we come into the study of the church of Smyrna. Number one in your notes, Smyrna, a crushed church, a crushed church. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. Verse 10, do not fear what you are about to suffer. So first of all, uh, in your notes, they faced persecution. Persecution is, or in your notes, it says tribulation, but the original says persecution. The word persecute is not when people say bad things about you. That's different. Persecution has the idea of to chase and pursue, persecute, to pursue someone with a whip, to, to constantly be beating you again and again. That's what persecution is. So basically, we have not really undergone severe persecution. We've gone through opposition, but not persecution like they had. But they went through persecution. The word tribulation comes from the Latin word tribulum, and it has to do with the stone wheels crushing out wheat to separate the kernel from the shell. That's the price they had to pay for their allegiance towards Jesus Christ. They were being crushed in that sense. Pressure being put, weight of heavy stones being placed upon them, constantly under tremendous pressure. Okay, we, a little bit, we say, oh yeah, don't be so stressed, you know. Okay, <laughs> but they were under tremendous, tremendous Persecution. They were not only suffering at the hands of uh, the unbelievers that were there, but also from the Jews because they were bringing in Jesus, whom they, the Jews were uh, supposed to be, you know, responsible for his death. So that was what they were going through. They faced tremendous persecution. Jesus, they also had, you know, uh, what G Jesus calls the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> People who were right there, they were... It's like under definite satanic control in their thinking. This was not just an ordinary, you know, opposition from another religion. It was called the synagogue, a gathering place where the enemy was in complete control and who, and they were, you know, accused of blasphemy. They, they were accused of so many things. And the word is slender. Right? The word is slender. In other words, to speak, uh, 
badly to bring false statements, damaging a person's reputation. That's what slander is, bringing in false statements to damage the reputation of someone. And they were bringing in bad statements to damage the reputation of the believers. The believers were accused of cannibalism. And you say, how can they be accused of cannibalism? Well, you know, when you go to this place, uh, they talk about eating the body of Jesus, the body. That thing becomes the body and drinking his blood. <laughs> cannibalism. And then when they had love feasts, you know, the church used to have love feasts. Everybody brought uh, food together. And so when they preach, we must have our love feast. We must gather for our love feast next Sunday. We're going to have a love feast. Oh, they said they're having orgies. Huh? These people, when they come in, they split families. You know, family all okay, all of them worshipping one God. They bring in another God. They're inside the house all fighting. And then when we say Caesar is Lord, they say, no, you cannot do that. You cannot bow before the... You know, in front of every marketplace, there would be a, a, a bust of Caesar. And so they would come and offer incense and then go inside the marketplace. That's why the Bible talks about do not eat food that is offered to idols. All, all the food, all the merchants would bring food and offer it to uh, the idols before they sacrifice or after they sacrifice, they offer and then they sell. Uh, okay, that's a whole different study altogether. So they faced uh, persecution. They also faced poverty. They faced poverty. The word here actually means absolute destitute absolutely destitute. When they became believers, very often their property would be confiscated. Uh, bank accounts would be frozen if they had a bank account. Whatever they had inside, the people would not want to do business with them anymore. Now, the Jews, they do business only with the Jews. Let's say you and I are uh, Jews, okay? You are a Jew, I'm a Jew. I, I deal with clothing and you deal with hardware, right? Like you run a DIY kind of a shop, you do a DIY shop. Now, we may not be on talking terms, but our shops are across the other side, and I'm on one side of the road, you are on the other side of the street, but we may not be on talking terms. We may not even know one another. But if I go, let's say I'm going for a, a, a convention on clothing or a big, uh, what do they have, a big uh, sale, in a different city where they are doing uh, an expo on clothing. And in that expo of clothing, I also see on the other side, there's an expo on hardware. So what I do is, I will go also not only just get my clothing, I would go to the hardware side because the guy on the opposite of my street, he, he may not know about this hardware, just suddenly open up the other side. So I go there and I get a lot of hardware material. I'll also buy those material, come back and sell it to my friend at the price I bought it for. No, no, no charging of interest because according to the laws, they were not supposed to charge interest with their brothers. So they would give it to the Jew. Now, when this guy from the hardware goes to a place and he sees a clothing thing, he will buy a lot of clothing, come sell it at the same price. That's how they would do business with one another, to help one another, although they don't know one another, yet because they are of the same faith, Jews would always help the Jews. This made them a big property. So when... You became, a Jew became a convert, accepted Christ. They would face, uh, abs they, they, they could become destitute because it would be removed. They would be treated badly in schools. The accounts would be frozen. We, you cannot come in and buy things on, on credit kind of thing. So they suffered a lot, tremendously. And, uh, but they still continued to serve the Lord, right? How the enemy must have mocked them. Look at these people, you know. You say that when you become a believer, you can, that's, that's this whole teaching on prosperity. If you are a believer, you will be rich. Tell them. <laughs> Jesus said you are poor, but you are rich. All right. C, they face prison. They face prison. Jesus tells them that there is more trouble ahead. They are not only going to face persecution, but you guys are going to be thrown into prison. And uh, by the way, the word 10 days there does not mean 10 days. <laughs> 10 days simply means a completion. 10, right? We count 1 to 10. How many fingers do you have? 10. After you count 10, that's it. Yes or not? So you count up to 10. But the, the, 
and, and so as I said, when you read through all these things, it is figuratively speaking, a thousand years. You should, reigning a thousand years. The word a thousand simply means complete. 144, 12 times 12 times 12 kind of thing. 144, right? So 12, 12, 12, 12. Now, it, it, it is just figurative numbers. Because if you say 144 people, you know, uh, who are dressed as virgins, whatever it is, they are all clothed in white, you're saying only 144,000 people are going to be saved. Whereas if you read the Bible, carefully read Revelation, it says there shall be a multitude which no one can number. Even the angels cannot number. That's how big the congregation of the righteous are going to be when they stand before the Lord. Okay, so prison in that day was nothing like prison like today. You're fed proper meals. This was dungeons. This was the area of uh, most of the dungeons were in the sewerage area where all the sewer flowed through the city, would flow through that path on its way out into the rivers. So you can understand it was not a very nice place to be in. And Jesus said, you're about to face this thing. This is the Smyrna church. So they were a crushed church. Also, secondly, the, Smyrna, the church at Smyrna was a consistent church. In spite of everything, even though they, it was tough, they were paying a harsh price for their faithful love, their service to the Lord. These people did not back up from their profession. No matter what it is, church, please, we must always stand firm. It's so sad, you know, when you see in church, somebody say something, people get upset, they leave church. What is this? What kind of a church am I building, I have to say? You know, there must be something wrong with either my ministry because people, I, I take it very personally. Oh, the person said like that. Why do they talk like, like that to me? Talking can upset you. If talking can upset me, I need to re-examine my faith. You know, last time when we started preaching, all Pentecostal preachers wore white shirts, black tie. That was a setup. So when we started wearing, you know, a colorful tie or, you know, preaching bell bottoms, <laughs> Don't laugh, don't laugh. Now it is all piped, okay? Bellboard, you know, big belts. You're not supposed to do all that. You're supposed to have, you know, really like straight pants, black pants, white shirt, black tie. And if we if we wore that, they said, oh, you're so, you know, your your tie make me, make me stumble. You know, the way you wear your clothes make me stumble. If my clothing can make you stumble, then you need to re-examine your faith. If little things can make us stumble in our Christian faith, we need to re-examine our faith. Not put the blame on other people. Why am I so weak? How is it because of something small, I can stumble so easily? I heard that person say this. This person did not shake my hand. We are nowhere close to being commended by the Lord. I'm, I'm telling you this honestly to you. Ask yourself. So they were a consistent church. Do I have consistency in my, in my Christian life? All right. These people were being crushed under the terrible and terrifying pressure of persecution. Yet they were releasing the fragrance of love. Remember they were famous for myrrh. They were being crushed, but there was a fragrance that was coming out of them. Now you understand why, you know, the Lord talks about myrrh in the church. And uh, he sent the seven letters to seven different churches. Five of the seven churches, you know, received words of rebuke and correction. In other words, in your notes, they had a positive testimony. Only this church and the church at Philadelphia received no corrective words. Two churches. The other churches have all received, you know, correction, rebuke, Sometimes very harsh words. The Lord had been observing their walk. He was pleased. I don't want the Lord to say, everything that you did was good, but I don't want that. Like the church at Ephesus. Great labor. Huh? I know your works. I know all the things that you did. You labored so hard, etc. Your patience. But there is no buts here. They had a very positive testimony. The question I ask myself is, do I have a positive testimony? Okay. Next, they had a powerful testimony. I know your works, just like the other one. But here the word works refers to the business which occupies a person's life. That in spite of what you are 
going through, you are still consistently doing what you ought to be doing. The first things have remained the first things in your life. You are still sharing. You are still uh, producing this wonderful perfume. You are in a sweet-smelling odor of Christ to the world in spite of all. Your testimony is such a wonderful testimony because, you know, they stayed the course, they stuck the task for the glory of God. This was a consistent Christian work, a consistent church. In spite of all the darkness around them, they were, they continued to be the light. They were not frightened by the hatred of their opponents. Uh, they proved that they were genuine. Their faith was real by the way they carried themselves in society. So they were a crushed church. They were a consistent church, but also they were a comforted church. Number three, they were a comforted church. Jesus comes to this beleaguered church, small church, gives them a message of comfort and they desperately needed to hear. So let's look, look at what he says to them. First of all, they had the interests of heaven. I know your works. The word to know is to know. I know by experience. I know uh, your experience and I know by experiencing what you are going through. I know you. The word to know is to be intimately uh, involved with a person. And, a and Adam knew his wife and she gave birth. That intimacy is there. I'm intimately involved. They had the interest of heaven in their hearts. And when they do it, God had seen them. God just wanted them to know that they were not alone in this whole thing. Amen. And they had the investment in heaven. They had their investment in heaven. I know your poverty, but you are rich. You have laid up treasures for yourself in heaven. Now, this is not a material thing, but uh, you, you have invested so much into the kingdom of God. What have I given to God that I can draw out. You know, we often say, don't keep your heaven in a bank. Keep your bank in heaven. I can only, you know, if I go to the bank, I can only draw out what I have put in. Think about that. What have I put in to the kingdom of God? My confidence in prayer comes because I have invested in the kingdom of my life. In the sense that, you know, you do that which is right. You work with the best of your ability trying to please God, not please yourself. Everything that you are doing is God that you might be honored in all that I do. Now, when you do these things that are right in the sight of God, your confidence in God, your in prayer is so great. Why? Because you know that God will not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. Are you following with me? Because I walk uprightly, I have invested in heaven. Because I work what God wants me to do, I have invested in heaven. So when I come in prayer, I can draw out from the back. I know that God will give me. I know God will answer my prayer. So your investment in heaven is so important. This church suffered a lot, but they still continued. That's why they were investing in the kingdom of heaven. They were poor, on the earth, people look at them like they are poor, literally, but they were so rich in their spirit man. There's nothing more wonderful than, like I, I've mentioned this before, than being satisfied with all that God has given to you. See, a satisfied person is not easily tested. Uh, nothing can shake him because you're already satisfied. I don't want any of these things. I don't need these things. God, you are so good to me. They had their inheritance in heaven. The Lord promises to give them a crown of life. Their faith had purchased for them more than just a testimony. Their faith had purchased for them eternal rewards and inheritance in the kingdom of God. He promises them the crown of life. The word crown is the word Stephanos, uh, which literally means victorious, conquering. I think Pastor Stefan knows what his name is. 
It means to be a conqueror, to be an overcomer, uh, to be victorious. That's what the word Stephanos. They, they receive a laurel crown. Uh, it was very green leaves that they make like a little wreath. I think you have seen that, you know, in Olympic Games in years gone by. You see in old, mo old movies, you see them put that crown uh, above their head, you know, a crown of leaves on top of their head. And so... Uh, the apostles write to the church and he says, don't labor for a crown that will eventually fade because those leaves eventually fade, but labor for a crown that will last forever. And he says, I will give you the crown of life. And that's what it means. An eternal crown, a crown that will last for life. Now, again, uh, this is figurative. Uh, I don't think all of us are looking forward to going and getting a crown on our heads, uh, you know, but a reward from the Lord. In those days, a crown meant everything. And the Bible says they come and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy, worthy you see. It's not a literal casting of our crowns, but just to say all my glory, whatever I receive, Lord, I, I worship you with this. What a wonderful church, a church that went through such tremendous persecution and the Lord praised them and said, you know, you guys, it's not the end of the journey. It's the beginning because you're about to be tested. You're about to be pressurized. You're about to be thrown into prison. You're going to become prisoners. Uh, it's going to be for a season of time. So at the, at the meantime, continue with what you are doing. Continue to persevere. Continue to serve. Continue to have your flame burning inside of you. You are poor on the outside, but on the inside, you are so rich. And I thank you for who you are. That's what Jesus was saying to them. And may the Lord say the same thing to us. Remember, this is viewed prophetically. This is viewed practically. This is viewed personally. How can I apply this to my life? How can I serve you, Lord? Let me not take the, the you know, offense at the slightest issue and complain, but rather let me just continue to serve you to, you know, with Christ in the vessel, I can smile at the storm. Uh, we used to sing that song. So, Lord, teach me to praise you even in the storm that I'm going through. And our reward is eternal. Amen. All right. So the Lord bless you. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer. Once again, Lord, we take great comfort from your word. What a mighty church it was. Make us this kind of a church. We pray against any kind of persecution. Of course, we do not want to go through it. But whatever may come our way, Lord, we do not know the about to happen. We do not know what's about to take place. All we know is that our confidence is in you, our strength is in you, our reliance is upon you. So, Lord, lead us, guide us, help us, Lord. We desire with all our hearts to uh, serve you in spite of what we go through. May the little things of life not take such a overwhelming thing over us, but let us be overcomers instead. To him who overcomes, Lord, you will cause us to wear the crown of life. And we thank you, Father. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your promises that are always yes and amen. Bless your people, I pray. Give them a great week. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed.